Welcome to the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast, where we discuss world building and occasionally read aloud to you. While the spotlight is intended for the Grand Hill Chronicles, we often go far afield. Today, I present to you an interview with science fiction author Martin L. Shoemaker. We are going to discuss conlangs, or constructed, invented languages, and how language shifts over time. Before we get to today's contents, let's catch up a little bit. I did not publish a podcast episode in May. Several things hit at once or in close sequence, pushing this to the back burner so I couldn't even do one episode. And that's not even recording. This episode was recorded on April 15th, 2023, just over two months ago as I speak to you today on June 17th. One thing that's taking up some time is we're trying to remedy the cigarette smell in our old house. We have quotes from ServPro, but since there has been a period of several months with the mortgage draining our savings, with no tenant, we're trying to do more of it, more of the work ourselves in order to save some money. Also, in May, my wife left town to tend to some matters in another state, and although I took some time off of work to be with the kids, there was an overlap between me going back to work before Lila returned. So my parents came to town to help cover the gap. Somehow, it got worked in there that my sister was coming in, coming with her kids while her husband worked on some certification. Uh, And it sounded like a good idea at the time, but let me tell you now that although I loved seeing my sister and nieces and nephews and my kids and, and her kids are, you know, the cousins loved playing together, it was bad timing. My sister homeschools her children, but my kids were still in school and they were not on summer break. So I found it, I found myself coming home from work and being the party pooper, calling an end to playtime and stuffing food in faces as fast as possible in order to get my kids in bed. You may recall from another episode how early their school started, so they had an early bedtime while their cousins didn't. It was very stressful to say the least. It was so difficult. Will we have them over again? Of course, but not while I have to go to work and Lila is out of town and the kids are in school and we're not even fully settled into our new house and we still have to turn around our old house because the renters smoked in it. Yeah, Uh, good idea, bad timing. Next time will be better. Uh, Also, my health has been suffering somewhat. A couple of weeks ago, I had a fever and chills, uh, so much so that like I was... Two evenings in a row, I was shivering uncontrollably. Uh, I could not warm up with a nice blanket on, and and the only way to get rid of the chills, the only way to stop shivering, was a very hot bath. And then after that, I'd do some profuse sweating for a few hours. Turns out it was strep, and doctor gave me an antibiotic, and the strep calmed right down. And then there's my knee. The doctor says with the amount of time that it has been without improvement, it may be time to consider surgery to debride the tendon. And it's kind of scary. Like, uh, I looked up success rates, and while it says 77%, I've also seen some things say that this issue never fully goes away. Uh, So I've got some decisions there. Um, Some nice, lovely patellar tendonitis. Uh, Now, I do have some big news in my life, which is only four days old right now, but I'm going to sit on that one and not share it because it has not taken proper shape yet. Sorry. So uh, one more thing before we get into today's discussion is a sincere apology in advance. I had audio issues. I didn't realize it while recording this interview, but my microphone record level was set much too high. So, um, Audiate has an algorithm to try to fix audio clipping, and maybe I don't know how to use it right, because the output is still not great. Um, Anyway, it's good enough that you can clearly hear what I'm saying, so I hope you'll forgive me the little uh, mix-up, and I'll make up for it in my next episode, I promise. It's already recorded, so that's how I know I can promise that. I've listened to that recording. Now, without further ado, today's world-building discussion on Conlang. Uh, 
Okay, so here I am with Martin L. Shoemaker, author of Blue Collar Space and some other titles. I don't know if you want to highlight some of the things you've written. Probably what I'm most known for is The Last Dance, which is a novel in my Blue Collar Space universe. And today I am Carrie, which is not in my Blue Collar Space universe, but was my debut novel. So those are what I'm probably most known for in the reader community. Okay. I have not read those, but I looked on Amazon really quick, and they are they're sci-fi. I've enjoyed science fiction in my time. So that, that's what I do as well, science fiction. And I focus more on fantasy is what I'm finding. I didn't know that about myself before diving in. That's probably good because, in general, it's a bigger market, so you've got a bigger target to aim for. My tendency is the idea is what I'm going to write next. I don't pick and choose. So uh -huh. I'm off to fantasy these days, and then I'll be back to my blue-collar space somewhere in the next project. How far ahead of time do you have your ideas? Once you have an idea, how long is it before you write that? And do you note them down to come back to them later? I have a spreadsheet I call the idea pile, and some of the things that are in there have been in there for more than a decade, because once it's in the pile, it's to some extent it satisfies my urge of, okay, that idea, I don't have to worry about it now, it's recorded. So I tend to honestly work on the fresh ones more than what's in the idea pile, but if I'm bored, I leaf through the pile and pick up something. Okay. My current project, which is fantasy, is one that's been in the idea pile, I want to say most of a decade now, but it's one that keeps coming back to me, and eventually I said, if it keeps coming back to me, I've got to write this one. Other times, I'm generally by nature a pantser, by the seat of my pants, and so there are times where, oh, I have the idea, and two minutes later, I'm dictating. So it really varies from one to another. Okay. So I've been working on the Grand Hill Chronicles on and off, I guess mostly off because it's still not very far into the story written yet. But I started it for NaNoWriMo in 2010. Oh, dear. From Lena. Hush. That's a Oh, I can't close this other door without moving the camera. I apologize that I'm introducing little delays and things that I'm going to have to edit it out. That's... Honestly, I... Not a problem. I'm a little nervous. They say that production takes twice as long as recording. Oh, at least. At least. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been working on the Grand Hill Chronicles for a long time, but not really much else until last year I started having a bunch of ideas hit me. And I think last year is when I finally figured out how to ca capture my daydreaming, somewhat, at least. Because I've had ideas like, oh, that'd be cool. I've had ideas like that all my life, pretty much. But it wasn't anything like, I didn't realize, that, yeah, that would be a cool thing. I've got to make it happen. And to help us get to know you better, like, I I know you did 30 years as a software developer? It, actually, that's almost a decade out of date in my bio now. I probably should go touch that up. I've been a professional developer at some level since 1981. Okay. And professional full-time since 1985, I think. So, so I am a programmer first, a writer second, and that's okay because both are creative. Both give me things that I really enjoy out of it. But writing is a very different experience, so I'm trying to make sure I keep that in my schedule, keep my time open for that. Okay. And how did you first get into writing? I cannot remember a time when I wasn't a writer. For one thing, my memory, I use my memory all day long. It's part of the job. Constantly using my memory, but weirdly, I don't have many memories from my childhood. Practically the only memories I do have are writing stories. And my mom used to say that I was telling stories before I could write, and I can vaguely remember those that that when I had imaginary friends, they had very elaborate adventures that I would tell anybody who would sit and listen. So I've always had this desire to write and probably would have tried valiantly, because we all know there's no guarantees in this business, but I've tried valiantly 
to make a living of it until in my freshman year of high school when my algebra teacher saw how far ahead of everything I was and how bored I was. And he sat me down and said, this is a computer. This is a program. You should write one of these. And I got sidelined, completely sidelined, that I am very naturally talented at something that I think is a lot of fun and is a high demand job. Gee, it's fun, it's creative, and I'm going to get paid money for it. And so yeah. I got sidelined there, did not pursue writing as a career, just as a sideline. Okay. I don't know if many of my listeners, all two of them, I don't know if many of my listeners realize this, but I have some background with computer programming as well. I've always liked computers. They they seemed fun. And I remember when I was five or six years old, we got our first computer at home, and my dad did something with basic that made the computer print out numbers and he count he made it count to a thousand and we were kind of like whoa he did that so fast and it's just all in ms dos but then later when i was about 10 i checked out a book from the library on programming in basic and i spent maybe an hour trying to follow the instructions to program a tic-tac-toe game in basic and i didn't make it work but then I did take a computer science class in high school, and the focus of the class was learning principles of computer science, but it used C++ as a tool, so that was my exposure to C++. I got to college, and I took a couple of programming classes, got some exposure to Java, and then I was a missionary for two years, and after my mission, I did not take any more programming classes because I had been able to decide my focus by that point to be a music major. But I did, however, get a programming job on campus. And so I, I learned ActionScript, and I was a Flash programmer, and messed a little bit with XML, and a tiny bit with HTML, a tiny bit with PHP, excuse me, but most, mostly ActionScript, which is it's Java-like. Yeah. But now that's a dead language. It happens. Yeah. Technology moves on. But as far as writing or telling stories at a young age, I think what stopped me were two things. One is that I like I talked about my daydreams a few minutes ago. I just I don't make them percolate down into something that I I talk about. I just enjoy it in my head. It has been my historical habit. And then the other thing, because I did actually start to write a book when I was 10 or 11 years old. I called it Pete's Parade, and it was about my, oh, 11. I got my parakeet when I turned 11, so I wasn't 10. Yeah, it was a story about my parakeet, except he could talk and understand human speech. And I don't remember how far I got into it. I think I got just a couple of scenes into it, but I had imagined all the way to the end very loosely. So what stopped me from pursuing it was being told that it's really unlikely to make it. Very few authors get published. You send in your query letters or you submit your manuscripts and very few ever get chosen. So why bother? Nowadays that's turned on its head. If you want to publish, you can publish. And the, if you want to be found really it's on you to make sure your story is good and to publicize it. Yeah. And I have to say as a side note, so you decided that it was going to be really long odds as a writer, so you went into music. Yeah. Where yeah. it's really long odds. I got my degree in music education. So True. that's somewhat doable. Although a lot of music educators wind up doing something else, like me. But for it can be for various different reasons. In my case, I got my music degree. I got my teaching job in a small town in Kansas. That's just where I found my job coming out of college. We moved out there. We bought a house. And then after a year of a really frustrating time because I was the band teacher in town, 5 through 12, grades 5 through 12, I didn't feel very supported, and maybe that was just in my mind because I've, I've been learning 
about myself in the last several years that I don't communicate the way that other people do that I had imagined that other people do. And anyway, so after that first year, I was really frustrated and I was going to stick around, but then I, a little bird told me that they didn't want me either. I say either. I did want to stick around. It was difficult, but I was going to stick it out. I was going to keep trying. And I found out that they didn't really want me. So I went ahead and resigned rather than letting them non-renew my contract. There's a story to be told there. I'm not giving all the details right now, but that's suffice it to say that it was no longer a, a good place for me to stay. So I resigned, but I'm like, now what? I'm in a small town. If I'm going to keep teaching, we need to move somewhere else. But we bought this house. We have student loans, both my wife and I. But we're trying for me to be the sole income because that's the family, the, the family life that we want to have. And teaching would not pay enough to move. If I went and got another teaching job, wouldn't pay enough for us to move out of the situation we were in. And so I called a recruiter and spent the next seven-ish years playing my clarinet for the Marine Corps. And after that point, I went to the officer side. And and you go into the officer side, in most cases, without already having your job field determined. And so when I was at officer training and they were going to determine my 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 job field, my MOS, military occupational specialty, I passed a couple of interviews that that I had gotten myself into voluntarily and became a cyberspace warfare officer. Leaning back to my enjoyment of computers and wishing to to get closer to coding. It my job has no coding in it, unfortunately. But I wanted to ask you more about about your background and here I am telling you all about mine. No, but I, I think it's always fascinating how we end up where we're at and all the steps along the way. Yeah. You're in Michigan? Yep. Is that correct? What brought you to Michigan? For me, the Marine Corps brought me to Virginia. But what I was here by birth. Okay. At least the last couple of generations of my family here. So I'm mostly here by inertia. Okay. Uh, family is around. Friends are around. I'm living 20 miles from where I grew up. So it's one of those things where it's what I know. And around January, I hate it. And around this time of year, I love it because I don't like to drive in the snow. Fortunately, the current job has a lot of work from home because we've just been through two years of teaching us that, yes, you can do a lot of work from home. They want us in the office a couple of days a week, but really we're doing most of our work online these days. So I could live just about anywhere. I'm still living where friends and family are around. Okay. Yeah. I wish I were closer to a lot of my family. So I grew up in Texas, but both of my parents grew up in Utah and I went to college in Utah. I loved that aspect while I was there because my extended family gets together once a month. And since we moved away, I haven't been able to go to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's and nice. that, that is family. such a different world out there that there are a lot of the support networks in a place like that. And you move away and gee, where's the support network? Uh-huh. Yeah. So today we're having this, oh my goodness, this is what I'm, okay. So today we are going to talk about conlangs. And for our listeners, what is a conlang? That's a constructed language or an artificial language like Esperanto, which was invented with the intent of being a universal language. Now, I don't speak it. I don't know if you speak it, but I don't know if it's achieved that goal of being a universal language. But a lot of people do speak it. And according to my research last night, a lot of people speak it as their first language, which is really interesting. So if we're talking about languages, why are they relevant to storytelling? And I think we could solve that, answer that question pretty quickly by bringing up examples like Lord of the Rings, where there are elves, they have their own language. The, there's a separate language of Mordor. Uh, Star Trek has these alien races and each one has its own language. And, and some people 
have in the real world have actually learned to speak Klingon. Then there's the Wheel of Time, which is a little bit different, because in the Wheel of Time, there's a lot of there are a lot of references to the old tongue, and that's what it's called. It's it to my memory, it's never given a name apart from the old tongue, and to my knowledge, it was never formed and codified the same way as Elvish or Klingon was. Like I don't think there's anybody out there who speaks the old tongue. It's just a resource that Robert Jordan created so that he can draw on, and he has to throw in some made-up words that belong to the old tongue. But the fact of the matter is that people before spoke a language that they don't speak now, and that's very relevant to the story, and so hence the old tongue. So what's your take on this, Martin? What? There, there's certainly there's degrees. I confess I haven't read Wheel of Time yet, so your description there is a hundred percent of what I know. But it represents one extreme of the spectrum, because essentially then the book is being told in what is translated into English, but with a reference of yeah, there has been this other, all the way to the far extreme of the Tolkien and where realistically, he started with the languages. I had a interesting introduction into this. When I was in college, I was looking for a good elective to take, something that would get me some English credit, and there happened to be a course on Tolkien. And I'm like, okay, I want to take that because it's a class where I don't have to worry about reading the writing. It'll be easy. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. I have a stubborn personality that I cannot read assigned reading. Uh -huh. I'm really good at skimming and keeping up with notes and pretending like I read the assigned reading, but I can't read assigned reading. So I thought, here's a class where I can read the assigned reading because I already have 15 times at that point in my life. Uh -huh. It turns out that even when it's Tolkien, I can't read assigned reading. But I'd read it 15 times already. So I said, yeah, this is a class I can take. And what I discovered in taking the class was the class itself was somewhat about this topic of Khan Lang, which I don't think we had the term back then, but that was basically what it was. But from Tolkien's point of view, he was actually a philologist. Mm -hmm. which one of the things I learned was definition of philologist and the Latin roots of it, which means basically lover of languages. Uh -huh. So philo was language and logist is lover or student of. And start oh. digging into this. Yeah, I, I may not have the derivation there exactly right, but essentially it's this is a person who studies the formation of languages. And... What his big study was at Oxford, was he, I think he was, yeah, he was Oxford. His big study there was on the history of language and particularly the English language. He was one of the ones who worked on the Oxford English Dictionary. So he was all about these histories and how history, how the language reflects the history of the people and how it shapes that and so on, which was a topic that had fascinated me from an entirely different direction. In, I want to say it was 1980 or so, there was a long PBS miniseries called The Story of English. And mm -hmm. essentially it was about how the English language came to be and all its different branches and so on. And so I'd been fascinated by that series and now I'm learning that was what Tolkien was studying, that the language reflects the history of the people. And the classic example from the PBS series was words for food. Because in the English language, we have cow and pig and chicken, but then we eat beef and pork and generally still chicken, but sometimes uh -huh. it's poultry. And how this turns out to trace back to the Norman invasion, yep. where all of a sudden we had a period of time in the British Isles, which were the source, the wellspring of English as we know it today, 
where the people raising the food were the serfs, the peasants, the conquered. And it was simple, gutsy words like cow, pig, chicken. And the people ruling things were the French nobility imports. And we had beef. And I'm not a French speaker, so I butchered that, I'm sure. But beef becomes beef and Uh pork and so on. And so it's reflecting a language. And that sort of thing was in Tolkien's mind that originally he started with building the language and wanted to say, okay, if these languages have this characteristic, how did that happen? What history led to this? What were the changes of this? Because actually he invented two different Elvish languages that I can remember off the top of my head now. We had the Sindarin and the Quenyan. The Sindarin was the low elf, the people of the woods, and the Quenyan were the elves who went off into the west and lived under the Valar and then came back. And so we've got two languages that somewhere deep in the past may have some connections, but they were essentially actually, evolved separately. Yeah, I read recently that he he created that back historical language first and then asked himself, how will this change over time as these two cultures split and live separately and differently? And that's how he derived the two Elvish languages from the historical language. Or, yeah. And then a lot of the history that became the stories was, how would these changes have happened? I need to write what was happening in the world that led to these linguistic changes. And he even leaned on real world linguistic changes or when in in his writing in english we have the wargs and all offense that aren't just let me take a word and change it but warg is uh, and i don't know how to pronounce it in another language but apparently that's wolf in i don't know i don't remember i'm sorry if it's old english or if it's some norse language but yeah he took some words of your yep and included them yep david farland also known as dave wolverton he had some interesting books for writing and i don't remember which one he talked about this in about tolkien's development of these languages it may have been in writing wonder where it's there's actually oh no it was drawing on the power of resonance in writing because he was talking about how Rather than trying to escape our influences, which is an impossible task, it's not going to happen, Uh use the resonance of our images, of our influences, as a tool for making readers comfortable in our stories. And he's talking about how so many of Tolkien's names that seem to us as original inventions, it's here's how they draw to Norse and Germanic roots. And Gandalf was one that... Yeah, it's original, but if you know where to look, you can find the antecedents to it. And there were some others as well mentioned. Excellent book for trying to embrace your influences. And if you're going to have them anyway, because you are, try to have them consciously. And so that was a part of it was the Germanic and Norse and other roots that Tolkien drew upon. do Do you speak any other languages besides English? I had... Four terms of college Russian, and I still am awful about it. How I got out alive, I'm still not sure. I can read the Cyrillic alphabet, and I can recognize what's being said in some places, but I cannot formulate an idea more complex than preschool language at best. Duolingo got me to the point where I can read a little bit of Russian. Just a little bit. I don't even recognize all the Cyrillic characters, but I know enough of them, but I can look and sound something out sometimes. But I was going to say, it. I think it's really intriguing how languages change over time. And I, I took three years of Spanish in high school, but I don't think I, I really gleaned anything special off that, and apart from what anyone else might. I, I do think I was one of the better students at it but nothing really special but then when i did my mission for two years i went and taught 
the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I was assigned to do it in Spanish. And so I went to a missionary training center for two months, which focused heavily on making sure we know the doctrine that we're going to go out and teach well, but also on learning the language. Like missionaries who are there to learn Russian stay there for three months. And missionaries who, and maybe it's changed a little bit since then, but at least when I went through, I was there for two months and missionaries who were going to go and teach in their own native language. It, like if you're in English already, you're not going to learn another language. You're only there for three weeks. But there was a focus there. And I think really during that time is when I started noticing, started realizing how languages evolve. And I had a five-week period where I was pretty committed to making sure that I was going to speak Spanish, not English. And during those five weeks, I believe I had... So not everybody there speaks Spanish. And not everybody there is there to learn Spanish. And so sometimes I had to talk with people in English because they, they weren't there learning Spanish. But for those five weeks, apart from two conversations, I just didn't speak English with people who were also learning Spanish. And I would force them, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not going to say it in English. If you want to understand the word I just said, you've got to look at it in a dictionary or maybe I can point like I'm talking about sleeve. I'm saying sleeve. Anyway, but I noticed that there were some things that I, they say that you can't translate directly, but you can if you recall another way of saying it in English. One example is the word toda in Spanish. Literally means yet. If you translate todavía as yet into English, then it will come out making sense every time. It may sound archaic, because nowadays a lot of times when you can say yet, we say still. And so if you go and learn toda, they're going to say it means yet or still, which is true. But if you want to just be able to translate it literally every time you can translate it as yet and it will work now somebody's gonna find a case to disprove what i just said but basically that's what i noticed and i noticed not cognates but and cognates are words that are basically the same in two languages but there are also words that are almost cognates or that if you look at them and say if i twisted this vowel sound around I can see that comes from the same root. Like you were talking about beef, or I also don't speak French, became beef. And there's the word for steak in Spanish is bistec. It's beef steak. At least that's the way I think of it. I think that's where it came from. Maybe not. But languages evolve and they affect each other. I think it's really intriguing how how languages do change. And you have so you have kinetic energy that word kinetic refers to motion but then you go to the movies and cinema but the that kin or sin is from the same root back in old yeah. latin or greek and it originally probably sounded more like tin i don't know i don't speak ancient greek or latin but it diverged into kin and sin and that's how languages change you have related sounds to each other yeah. You have, and some sounds that that don't carry over into another language, like in Spanish, they don't, most of the Spanish-speaking world doesn't have the phoneme or the sound that we pronounce for a TH, like when I say the word with, the last phoneme is that th, and most of the Spanish-speaking world doesn't have that sound, and if you tell somebody, here, say this, they don't have that phoneme either. There, there's th and there's th, but they'll have trouble saying this because it's not in their phoneme vocabulary. Just like we in English have trouble learning the Spanish phoneme, like rolling your R's. It's difficult for us because we're not practiced at listening and producing that sound. Um, yep. And also the D in Spanish isn't duh, it's the. It's, and you could say interdental. Anyway, obviously you can see that I think linguistics are fascinating, and I agree with you that languages change, and that's really intriguing. And the whole phoneme concept, both both the unique phonemes, but also the phoneme drift and shift, are a big part of this. 
there was oddly enough another PBS special or series that I grew up was on the mind, and it actually talked about this one, a famous experiment in language development that they have where they take very young kids and train them to expect a surprise when they hear a particular phoneme. I think it was like a clown's going to pop out and do a dance for them or something like that. Uh huh. And what they discovered was there is a stage in child development where you can train them with literally any phoneme on the planet. Uh huh. And then there's a stage later on as they're growing and learning the language where all of a sudden they literally cannot hear phonemes that are not part of their native language. I that, think that, that their brains have built up a filter. And if that phoneme is not used around them in their day-to-day -day world, it's not language. It doesn't exist. And I think, yeah, like that's the clicks in some African languages. To us, it sounds like if you were listening to a recording of speech, you might hear that sound and think, oh, there's a recording artifact there. It's a random sound that made its way into the recording. But no, it's actually, it's a sound in their language, like, mm -hmm. or ah. Yep. And then we get into the Asian languages, the tonal ones, where we've shifted away from even the concept of phonemes. Now we've got this complex concept where it literally is the tone of your voice changes uh -huh. the meaning. Yeah, which is so far off the wall of what we're used to as a Western European perspective. And it's just that much variety that essentially something in the brain is good at encoding information. But then we've got all these different ways of encoding that have developed in different cultures over time. Yeah. And some from common roots, some from the Indo-European roots, and some from, oh, no, this branch of language developed almost completely off on its own onto a different path. And it's crazy, like, how the language you speak interacts with your brain. Because, like, I read that there is a higher incidence of people with perfect pitch or absolute pitch among Asian cultures that speak tonal languages. I believe correlation is not causation. Maybe it's just inborn that their genes are coding for more people to have perfect pitch, but I believe it's because of the language. Or in other words, that they get the practice with it. At a young age, when it's when their brains are developing a lot faster and a lot more they're a lot more plastic, they get the practice and they learn to distinguish between different tones. Yeah. That we don't learn because we don't get that exposure. And it's people of your I read something that they said they didn't see the color blue, I think. But it's not that they didn't see it. Their eyes perceived it, and their brain processed it. But they didn't separate blue and purple. It was the same thing. And so I, there's, there's an Easter song that mentions the purple East. And it's not just Easter, but you, you hear about purple East, and you look up at the sky... And most of the time it's not purple, most of the time it's blue. That's what we would call it. But it's just because it, the color palette that they had distinguished, purple and blue were the same thing. And orange and red were the same thing. They didn't separate orange out. That's why it's redhead. Because orange was red. We have orange that comes from the fruit, which the English-speaking world, to my understanding, was exposed to through Spain through oranges coming up from Spain. And so the color is named after the fruit because the fruit is orange. And we as a culture learned to distinguish the color orange from the color red by associating it with the fruit orange. And thus, boom, now we can all tell the difference between orange and red. Yep. And there's, I think there's an element there where what you must distinguish in your life, you develop these fine gradations over. Because if you talk mathematically in computer imaging, which is only a subset of all possible things you can see, mathematically there are 16 million colors, 256 by 256. 
Yeah. You're saying in a 16-bit graphics environment. In, in a 24-bit. 24-bit. Okay, sorry. Yeah. And that's six, 16 million colors. Nobody's going to name 16 million colors. You don't tend to know, need to know the difference between 200, 200, 200, and 200, 200, and 201. You don't need a distinction that fine. But yeah. you might, in some cases, need very fine distinctions. And that area where you work, you pick up differences by the frequent usage of it and the frequent contrasts. There's another, I spent a decade working on computer color vision. So this is a little side specialty for me. There was a classic experiment on optical illusion, which you can do yourself with construction paper. Uh -huh. You take and cut out a circle of gray construction paper. And then you get some shades of red and some shades of green and some shades of blue. And you take those gray circles and you surround them with shades of red. And then over here, another gray circle surrounded with shades of green. And over here, another gray circle surrounded with shades of blue. And that gray circle is yellow. And this gray circle is purple. And this gray circle is, actually, I got those wrong. The red, you've got a cyan. The green, you've got a purple, and the blue, you've got a yellow, because what you are seeing is the contrast. They're gray, but there are, they are yellower than this blue, these yeah. blues around it. And so the brain sees difference. That I, my theory of intelligence is that it is largely about patterns and contrasts. That what we are evolved to see is what's the different things because those different things might eat us or those different things might be things we want to eat so we are evolved to pick up contrasts the on entirely different se sense of scent uh -huh. most of us most of the time when exposed to a given scent will become dead to it if we're exposed to it long enough because it uh -huh. no longer is a difference from the environment to the point where yeah, if you ask me, I smell the cat box. But as I walk through my day-to-day -day life, I don't smell the cat box on a given day. We develop these points where that's just the normal. That's familiar. What I hear is the difference. Uh. And so I think that is part of it is when you start working in an area, you start picking up finer differences. And so I think the actual color that they called it in those ancient times we translate it today as purple but it was in some of the metaphors it's the wine colored sea and so they're comparing it to color groups that they are familiar with in their environment yeah and, and later on we start seeing more distinction and if it's wine colored that could even be confused as red and so you can see it there, there's a shift things can be mistranslated or translated the best that it possibly could be and still wind up with a different meaning than was originally intended. Yep. It's crazy. So do you do you speak any conlang? Any invented language? Well, I don't. Back when I was in high school, I could speak Quenyan pretty well. And I could nice. recognize Sindarin and Tolkien didn't give us a whole lot of the Dwarven language, but the words he gave us I could pick out and pick out the pieces. I built my own Elvish dictionary before there were commercial ones available. And so I was actually pretty good with that for a long time. Today, I doubt I can pick out any of the root words at all. Hmm. But it's 30 years later. Yeah. I actually have it in my plans. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to mention that I once tried to learn Klingon and discovered that I was too busy. I've got the books. Yeah. I didn't study it. Yeah. So I actually, I have it in my plans to create my own conlang, and I don't know how much punishment I'm in for. I, I was surprised to learn that like you, you can Google and find instructions on WikiHow how to create your own conlang. Yeah, I don't know really how much punishment I'm in for because I've never tried it before, but it, I think the harder task is going to be deciding how it's structured, that the syntax works, 
what parts of speech I'm going to include or not include, or can I invent a new part of speech? I don't think I have the expertise to do that. But like in, in Russian, they don't have the word the. They don't have the definite article. Yep. And they don't have the verb to be. You don't say, I am... I don't know. It's weird. Again, I don't speak Russian, but... Yeah. But essentially, it's noun condition as opposed to noun is condition. Yeah, I happy. And, and because of how they've grown up, there is an implication there that this structure means to be. Th this uh -huh. combination of the words yeah, implies so a to be without a to be in there. You hear Russian speakers speaking English, and they overcorrect. And they say, I am to be going to... And they throw yeah. in when it, we would not use I am. And they throw in gerunds, the running, eating... They throw that in where we would say, I'm going to eat. They might say, I'm going to be eating because they're trying to they're trying to come from Russian where they don't have that and they come into English and they I need to add this in, they do it too much. Yep. But um, there was actually a, be, go ahead. So I on my mission, there was a missionary from Argentina. And if you know anything about the Spanish speaking world, in Spain they don't when they see the letter Z or a soft C, they don't pronounce it S, they pronounce it th. They actually do have the TH phoneme in Spain. Now in Argentina, most of the Spanish speaking world doesn't have the phoneme SH, but Argentina and some parts of Chile do. And the way they do that, and actually some parts of northern Mexico, but it comes at a, a, a trade off. So in most of the Spanish speaking world, they don't have SH, but they do have CH. And so you don't, you won't hear a, a Spanish speaker, they probably won't say Chevrolet, they'll say Chevrolet, they'll pronounce it with a CH. In northern Mexico, that CH is swapped out for a SH, and they have difficulty pronouncing CH. But in Argentina, they don't say YA, yeah, they say SH. So you'll, the word for I in Spanish is YO. And there are different ways it's pronounced, maybe in southern Mexico you'll hear JO, it's just a really harder diphthong instead of yo it's jo but in argentina it's sho so this one argentine sister this missionary she came to the united states because we were on our mission in arizona and so she had to learn english although she was there to teach in spanish she had to learn english to live there while she was there and one time she overcorrected with my name on, on the mission, I was Elder Bishop, but one time she overcorrected and she called me Elder Biop because she replaced <laughs> that sh with a y, and it's just an accidental thing. It, it happened once and it was funny, but. And that sort of linguistic drift is something that, as a hobbyist, as an amateur, I only see it here and there when someone points it out. But apparently it's a huge part of tracing the history of linguistics to watch mm -hmm. this drift that you can see that, oh, the drift is geographically s separated. That implies yeah. some motion, some division of these peoples in the past. Yeah, Th like the past participle in the Romance languages. The past participle is, I have eaten, I have made, I have gone. Okay, the past participle in Spanish ends with A-D-O. It is... Or ADO or IDO, depending on the verb. I'm not going to get into that, but let's say practiced. Okay? In Spanish, is in Italian, and I don't speak Italian, so pardon me for butchering, it's practicato. They end it with a T instead of a D. Instead of DO, it's TO. And in Portuguese, they get rid of the consonant altogether. Practical. It fell mm -hmm. off. So it, it's harder over in Italy. It's softer in Spain, and it's gone in Portugal. Yep. And this is, I was watching or re-watching the story of English because now you had me wanting to go back, and you can't find it on DVD anywhere, but you can find it on YouTube. And they were talking about essentially the discovery of Indo-European language, the Indo-European roots, and it was surprisingly late in time. I think they said it was 18th century where this one 
guy who was well traveled and doing studies starts picking up on similarities in certain words. It's, it's like the more elementary a concept is, the more you can pick out the similarities. And so the words for mother in eight different languages, they're not the same word, but you can see how close they are in structure to each other. And father, and there, there was like just a bunch of very basic human concepts. You could look and say, these are all similar. That the difference between pater and father is mostly a drift that we've taken the P becomes an F, which is easy, and the T becomes a thorn, a thick. Those are drifts, and he's pointing this out. <coughs> and this led to the linguistic study of languages, <coughs> excuse me, languages derived from some common Indo-European root that no one today speaks, mm -hmm. but you can start to see here's these connections that somewhere somebody spoke a common tongue and essentially there was a metaphorical Tower of Babel that over yeah. enough time and enough separation and enough specialization, other languages have derived from that one common way back when. Yeah, and you have, I don't remember what they call them, but basically ancestral words. You have a few words that remain in common across very different languages. Spit, apparently, is pretty similar more or less across a lot of different languages but and then uh, what's fascinating is to watch how they those lang those words drift and where when you see similar drift does that imply some historical connection between those two variant languages i think we should probably wrap it up i want to keep the podcast at manageable length for listeners um, okay i also need to go upstairs and help with the kids they're awake and my wife is fielding them Ah, so got to go do my duty. But we'll, all right, I think we'll finish up with four more questions. Do you have a favorite language, a favorite foreign language? A, a real world favorite language? Yeah. I'm partial to Portugal because a lot of my fiction has a connection to Brazil because I love the language and the music and the cuisine even of Brazil and so some of my characters reflect that and so although I'm not any good at it Portuguese especially Brazilian Portuguese has a very musical sound to me yeah yeah that's a good one I ooh, I don't know if I have a favorite one I like a lot of languages now if you could make a wish to speak three more languages natural or conling what would they be Brazilian Portuguese, because I would use that in my fiction. And again, it sounds very beautiful to me. Russian, just because I hate the fact that it beat me. But I've learned I'm not really good at language. I really am not. I am fascinated by it. But to translate it into a way of thinking has always eluded me. So I can study, but I can't really adopt. Mm. And so the fact that four four semesters of Russian and I still can tell you things like Tigri Zivut Vazi, the tigers live in Asia. I can tell you that because it was one of those few sentences mm. took hold in the first month of Russian and anything past that is gone. So I'd like uh -huh. to defeat that. Okay. And then I'd have to add in a an Asian language just so that I can see a different perspective there because... That's one of the beauties of studying other languages is you learn that there are other ways of thinking about things. They're talking about the some of the Celtic root languages that went into Welsh and how some of these languages, word position almost doesn't matter. That there mm -hmm. is declension different from different parts of speech. And so you can take and order the same words in completely different ways and it still has the same meaning because the declensions you put on subject versus object and so on and you get more of those distinctions in an asian language and so i think just to expand my mind i would probably because 
for my day job uses, an awful lot of developers that I work with these days are speaking Hindu or H Hindi as part of their regular life. They all speak so much better English than I am ever going to speak of their language. But I would want to pick up Hindi probably to be able to see that culture more. Okay. Now, if I were to answer my own question, I don't know. I think I would go for breadth. So I'd throw in Mandarin and maybe Russian. And oh, what else was I thinking? You know what? I'm going to throw in Quechua, an indigenous language in South America. But That one's okay. a new one on me. Next, where can our listeners find you online? Where is your home on the web? My seldom updated website is really simple, shoemaker.space. When the nice. dot .space extensions opened up, I said, a science fiction writer, I have to have that. Uh -huh. It has been a curse ever since because no one believes that dot .space can be a web extension. So they keep tacking <laughs> .com on the end of it. And space.com is a different domain entirely from me. Yeah. But so I, I have thorn.link. .link is yep. my top-level domain. And... I was actually trying to sign up for a, a new service earlier this week, and it wanted me to enter my email address, which ends in at thorn.link. And it didn't believe me. <laughs> it's like, that's yep. not a valid email address. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I'm going to rant and rave about my profession now, which is, I'm going to say it, all programmers are no talent hacks. We are lazy and we are stupid. And we have to constantly have people beat us over the head to make us actually work hard. But this is an odd case where, no, we could get away with this without working hard. People go and write their own email address validation routines, and mm. they think they know what the rules are, and they aren't. And every variation of Unix and Windows and Mac OS out there, every platform you can name has got a method you can call to say, is this a valid email address or not? And those methods get updated every time there's a new operating system upgrade to be up to date with the latest rules. So there's one call you can make to say, is this valid or not? But no, they write their own code. And man, you better have a .com or a .org or a .edu, or they're going to tell you're wrong. So when I, yeah, actually, I did that once, but it was, it was probably 2007, yeah. and there, there wasn't dot .space or dot .link, and I, I don't think ActionScript had this, this call to, this function to, to find out if something is a valid email address. If it did, well, whoops. But I've thought about that, and I imagine that it's, that the tool that I built at that time is no longer in use, but I think about it once in a while. Oh. What if it is, and somebody has a valid email address that it's not accepting? Yeah. Although it's probably not in use, and even if it is, they can just use their .edu addresses because all the people using it are professors and students at the university. Yep. But anyway. Uh, I run into this rant probably, it's not too bad now, it's a couple, three times a year I run into somebody where it's like a huge company that should know better and they're still hand validating these addresses. Uh huh. So that's shoemaker.space, S H O E M A K E R dot space. Yep. And, and also one more... pretty common on Facebook with at Martin L. Shoemaker. Okay. Pretty easy to find there. That's uh, okay. Sorry, I just had an awkward moment, so I'll, I'll edit that out. All right. And then one more question What is your favorite food? Favorites for me are always always a matter of what my taste is and what my preference is that day, so it drifts. I can, however, give a favorite cuisine. Okay. I was in Omaha teaching a class one time, and I was wandering around looking for something different to try. And in the middle of downtown Omaha, which we think of as boring prairie middle of nowhere, I discover a Persian restaurant, and I have been absolutely enamored of Persian cuisine ever since. Persian, uh, and part of it was the fact that it was, it was almost literally you're walking into these people's home. 
that it is a casual, relaxed thing, and they want you to love this meal. And the owner comes by at a certain point, and he's like explaining to me how this dish was put together and the proper way to get just enough rice and just enough tomato and just enough meat on the fork to get the perfect flavor blend. And afterwards, he pours a little special aperitif that's supposed to go with this meal. And I don't actually drink as a rule. I don't like the taste. But it was such a wonderful, inviting experience that it's like, he is offering me this. I will accept this because I want to be a gracious guest for this gracious host. And so the experience was wonderful. But the taste was, you could practically do this whole show over again on food instead of language because the taste of persian which of course today is iranian the taste of persian cuisine reflects that we've got our indian subcontinent over here we've got the middle east over here and we've got eastern europe up here and we're in the middle of all of that and they get a perfect all the things i like about all of those cuisines seem to intersect perfectly in the persian cuisine okay yeah, I like that that look of it, how it's in the middle there, and you have this fusion of different things. Yeah, and now I'm going to have to go have some Persian today because now I can't forget it. And including tomato, which is a new world vegetable. Like, they didn't have that 500 years ago. Yep, yep. And so I think you could honestly do the exact same topic of drift and fusion and adaptation and so on with food as you are doing with language. Uh, yeah, that would be fascinating, too. Uh, all right, that's all the time we have today. Thanks for your time, and yep, we might have to continue this another time. Sounds great. Have fun with the kids. Thanks, we will do. Thank you for joining us today on the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast. Please watch for our next episode, guaranteed to massage your eardrums like I hope today tickled your cerebral cortex. Now, you can get notified that the next episode has posted if you follow or subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, including YouTube. Share the love by leaving us a review so other people can find us. And you can also connect on social media. Just search for Grendhill on the big platforms. We're there. And again, thank you for listening or watching, and we'll see you next time on the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast.